What I want to speak to you concerning this morning is the safest place on earth. Quite a few years ago, someone said to me uh, about missionary work in the Philippines, they said, wow, you must really battle fear. Uh, I, I don't, it was, they kind of said, how could you go to a place where there's so many tropical diseases and dangers and lack of uh, law and order compared to America and so on. And I said, well, actually, I said to that person, it wasn't very safe to be a tourist a few years before that in visiting the Twin Towers in New York City. And I said, that wasn't a safe place, was it? Everyone that was in those buildings died. And I said, the only safe place on the face of the earth is the will of God. And uh, I said, I, I just do my, my best to determine and follow the will of God. That's, that's all I can do. The dangers are up to him. Praise God. Uh, <clears throat> the God we serve is uh, beyond our understanding in his greatness. I think of a story in the Bible when Elisha the prophet was in a certain small city in, in uh, Israel, and uh, the king of Syria had heard that, that Elisha was uh, telling the king of, of, of Israel all the plans of the king of Syria ahead of time by revelation. And he, uh, he sent an army to capture Elisha. And uh, during the night, that army surrounded the city where Elisha and his servant were staying. And when the sun rose, everyone saw this army, this great army surrounding the city. And Elisha's servant said, Master, Master, what's, what's, what's happening? What are we going to do? And Eli Elisha just said to him, uh, totally relaxed, there are more for us than there are for them. And then he said, Lord, please open the eyes of my servant. Open the eyes of this young man. And and all of a sudden, the servants saw the mountains all around, surrounding them, full of horses and chariots of fire, waiting to take care of that army. Then finally, the army and the leaders came into the city, and Elisha went to meet them. And he just said, Lord, blind these people. And there was a spiritual blindness that came over that whole army. And the Elisha, the one that they're sent to capture, is standing in front of them, and they didn't know it. Elisha said, this isn't the way, and it's not the people. Just, just follow me, and I'll, I'll lead you to what you want. And so then he led this whole army to the capital city, Samaria, to the king, the royal city. And, and when they were all there, surrounded by the army of, of Israel, he, he said, Lord, open their eyes. And all of a sudden, they realized they're captured by the army of Israel. Well, that's the God we serve. That's the God who's taking care of you. That's the God who is tenderly watching over every one of you who love him. Um, if you want God, he wants you. If you see your desperate need and cry to him for help, he will open the windows of heaven to pour upon you everything you need to be safe and secure, to be gradually changed into his likeness, and to fulfill all his will in your life. Matthew 5 begins with a list of the Beatitudes. You're all probably familiar with that a wonderful passage. Uh, those eight Beatitudes are like a ladder of spiritual growth in, in the Christian life. God's will for every one of us. God's plan. God's determined will to, to work His good work in every single one of His children. The first Beatitude 
is really the most important in, in this regard. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Uh, I translate that according to the JCS translation, John Charles Stutzman. <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they have it made. Can you imagine? But that's what it's saying. Blessed are the poor in spirit, Jesus said, for God is going to open up all the resources of heaven to that person. Then you go through all the Beatitudes, all eight of them, and you get to the last one, the one that represents spiritual maturity, Christian perfection, if you will. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, persecuted for doing what Jesus would do, persecuted for their godly living. Every one of the Beatitudes has a promise, has a result, if you will. And that last beatitude says, blessed are they that are persecuted for doing what Jesus would do. And the answer is, the, the promise, the same, very same thing as the first beatitude. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Why would, why would Jesus give the very same promise to the beginning and the ending of his work? Because... Exactly what I said earlier. If you hunger and thirst, if you are desperate, if you see your need, if you want God with all of your heart, no doubt, no doubt about your future. God, do, God will do all the rest. The work, the heavy lifting is always God's part. The weakest one will reach God's very best. Praise the Lord. So that's kind of where we're going today. I want to look with you first at John chapter 15, the message Jesus gave concerning the vine and the branches. And uh, you're, you're probably well aware that this dissertation of Jesus, this teaching, if you will, to his disciples, took place the night he was betrayed. So these were some of Jesus' parting words to those that he had been uh, looking after as a, sh a good shepherd, that he had been mentoring for the three and a half years of his ministry. And so he begins by saying, in John 15, 1, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Uh, forgive me for using the King James Version. I just can't help it. <laughs> I just love it. To me, I'll put a little plug in for it. I, I feel it's unsurpassed in the beauty of the poetry and the sublime oratory of this book, this translation. And uh, I love it. And uh, that's all, <laughs> before I get into trouble. <laughs> I use many translations in study, so I'm not, it's not like I'm a King James prophet that says everyone else is going to hell or something. I am the vine, and my father is the husbandman or the gardener. We have an image here, don't we? We have um, an illustration. Uh, it's, it's not literal, but it's spiritual. Jesus is the trunk of the grape vine. Verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, or prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So our job is to abide, stay in the vine. God's job is to bring forth the fruit. This is really a summary of the whole passage, actually. If you, if, you, if you don't bring forth fruit, you're going to be cut off. Uh, and if you do bring forth fruit, God's going to work in your life, so you bring forth more fruit. That's a little summary of the whole passage, and it's a summary of the Christian life. Verse 3, Now are you clean? Through my word, through the word that I have spoken unto you. Verse 4, abide in me and I in you as the branch 
cannot bear fruit of itself, on its own, by itself, apart from the vine, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. Fruit. God expects fruit from you, from me. It's not works, but it is fruit. And that fruit, the first fruit, the first fruit that must be found in our lives is the fruit of repentance. Remember when uh, Jesus was coming early in the morning from Bethany to Jerusalem with his disciples in this uh, near the time of the end? He, he saw a fig tree in the way, and he was hungry. And it was the time of the early figs. Figs have two, two, two harvests. The first harvest is just a few fruit, but they're luscious, and obviously if there are only a few fruit, it's nice to get one of them. And he came up to the tree expecting to find at least a few of these big, nice, luscious figs. And uh, he, he got in the tree, and all he found was leaves. So all there was leaves. And he stepped back from the tree in front of his disciples. He cursed it. Seems like an unnecessary overkill, doesn't it? You know? Most people would say maybe next year. <laughs> but Jesus said, let no man eat from you ever again. In one of the passages, it says the disciples watched and the tree just went, whoa, and shriveled up right in front of their eyes. And they said, wow, how quick the curse of Jesus on that tree took place. And I want to say to you, the Christian life is just totally fake and meaningless, and there's no future without repentance. God's looking for repentance because the Holy Spirit was given. It was one of the main purposes for Jesus to come upon the earth. He came to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that what John the Baptist said? And, and after the resurrection took place, it wasn't the end. Jesus said, uh, you're going you're to preach the gospel and preach uh, that I've risen from the dead and that there's remission of sins, but don't leave Jerusalem without baptism in the Holy Spirit. It was essential. The Holy Spirit is in the earth to convince of sin, of righteousness, and judgment. Those are some of the primary issues that flow out of the Holy Spirit. So, once we give our lives to Jesus... We have God, the Holy Spirit, working in our lives to move upon us in every time of sin. Sometimes sin takes us by surprise, sometimes by deceit, sometimes we're not fully aware that it was sin, it was maybe just something to us, human, right? Hey, I'm just human. Well... Just human is often sinful. <laughs> and uh, my Bible, the King James Version teaches <laughs> that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Isn't that true? So in a sense, it's not just shooting someone and killing them that sin. It's not just committing adultery with your neighbor's wife that sin. It's not just stealing that sin, but it's anything that comes short of God's glory. And uh, God works a little more uh, refined. The Holy Spirit works on, in more of a refined way as we go on with the Lord, and littler things become big to us because the Holy Spirit is working on the fine-tuning <laughs> of the vessel. The Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. It's a wonderful thing. I, I think I've, everywhere I go, I share this, so I'm sure I've shared it before, that, that repentance is vital. Repentance is, is what keeps us on the path. Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 35, I think it begins in verse 8, a few verses to the last 
verse, I think 11 or 12. And, and it talks about a highway. It says there's a way, a highway and a way called the way of holiness. No lion can be there, ravenous beast. But it says this, the redeemed are there. The redeemed are on this holy path. And that's where God puts you and me when we give our lives to Jesus. The redeemed are there. So what, what does that mean? It means those that are washed in the blood of Jesus are on. The, I'm going to come down just for a minute. That way I can't fall off the platform. <laughs> One time I heard Mark went flying almost <laughs> into the symbols or something. Okay, God puts us on this path. Let's say this is it. The path of the just. The way of holiness. And every born-again Christian's there. So what does that mean? We're going to sin. Because we're sinners. We're redeemed, but we're sinners. We're redeemed, but we're not perfect. We're redeemed, but we're susceptible to some of the tricks of Satan. So, we're walking on this path with all the redeemed. And ah, we fall. Ah. We fall. Oh my, oh my, I'm so. The Holy Spirit comes. And, whoa. The Holy Spirit comes and convicts us. The Holy Spirit shows us our need and we, we feel grief. We feel guilty and we repent. We ask the Lord to forgive us. We stand up again. Where are we? We're still on the path. Isn't that wonderful? We're still on the path. And, and, and Isaiah 35 is so wonderful. It says, This path, it leads to Zion. It leads to God's best. It's not a level path. It's a path, an ascending path, where our lives are changed, where we're becoming more and more like Jesus every day. And as we walk, we fail. But as we go on, it's going to be less and less. But because of the blood of Jesus, we are the redeemed. Because of the Holy Spirit working in our lives, we are washed, we are cleansed, and we belong there. It's for the redeemed. It it reminds me of a of a, a communion service. There was, um, there was a, a little old lady, simple lady, wonderful lady, out in the congregation, and during the communion service, everyone was told by the pastor, please, when you pass the emblem to the person next to you, just say to them, this is my body, which is broken for you. This is my blood that was shed for you. But when this little old woman got the emblem, she couldn't remember. She's holding them in her hands, and suddenly she looks at her neighbor and says, here, this is for sinners. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that got it. That was the right message. (laughs) So that's the way. That's the way to Christ's likeness. That's the way to delight the Lord with your life. That's the way to finish well. What did I just share with you? But what happens if you fall down on that path, some sin that you, you chose, you gave pleasure, you enjoyed it, and you feel in your heart, you make a decision that was, there was a lot of pleasure in that sin. You know, the pleasures of sin. The Bible says Moses chose. Rather, he chose to suffer persecution with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin. If there were no pleasures in sin, we wouldn't have a problem, would we? But if we don't repent, the Holy Spirit's there, but we don't repent. We have a will. And that temptation comes again, and we yield to it again. That temptation comes again, we yield to it again. And each time we commit sin and don't repent, our heart's getting a little harder. Getting a little harder. And instead of staying on the path which God intends for every Christian, we are stepping off the path. We're stepping off the path, and here's some jungle. Worse than the jungles of Palawan. And, and, And we're actually getting lost in the jungle. And, and we're getting less and less convicted. We're feeling more and more comfortable in our sin. And finally out here, you know what? We don't even know if God exists. We don't even have conviction. We don't. That actually happened in my life uh, as a pastor. There was a, a young man 
young married man had little children. He had been an alcoholic and uh, he got saved and he started coming to our church. And, and this man, in, in our midweek service at that time, in those years, it was really almost all prayer. We, I just give a short exhortation and, and we would gather around the altar and pray. And I would always get down from the pulpit and kneel with the people. And this man always made sure he was right at my side. His name was Frank, and, and I'm telling you this, he met the Lord every week. He made a puddle of tears next to me every week in prayer meeting, crying out to the Lord. It was wonderful. It was great. But every once in a while, his old buddies would come to his house and talk to him, and, and they'd say, come on, Frank, let's just go to the bar for old times. And Frank said, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't drink anymore. I, I gave my heart to the Lord. And they'd say, come, Frank. Just drink Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. There's Coca-Cola at the bar. And every time he went with him, he ended up getting drunk. And he come crawling back and said, Pastor, I, I wasn't here for a couple of weeks because I couldn't stop drinking. And I'm so sorry. I just fell back into my old ways. And, and I, I said, Frank, I understand and God understands, but you, you must make a decision not to walk with those guys. Maybe later on you can go and help to rescue them, but right now you need to stay out of every place that uh, is a weakness in your life. Well, what happened was he couldn't say no to his, his buddies, and he, he kept getting drunk, and he kept staying away longer. Then he'd come for a little while, and then he'd be away for a month, two months. Finally, he never came again. Never came to church. Then he left the area. His wife left him, and he ended up out west. And maybe 10 years later, there was a knock at my door, and it was Frank. He said, Pastor, uh, I'm in town. I wonder if, if I could talk with you. And I said, sure, Frank. Let's, let's go next door to the church. And we, we went next door and chatted for a while, and he, I was listening, and, and uh, I shared a little bit with him. And all of a sudden, he just looked in my eyes, and he said this. How can you be so sure that there's a God? And it was like a, a total shock to me because I had the flashback of this man weeping in the presence of the Lord, in love with Jesus, wanting to serve him. But he had stepped off the path, stopped repenting of his sin, and hardened his heart until finally he didn't even know if God existed. We need to make sure that we have that first fruit. What is it? It's repentance. No other fruit can grow in your life unless you keep that first, that fruit. Jesus is looking up into your tree, wanting to see that fruit, fruit of repentance. Verse five, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. God's the one that does the work. God's the one that brings forth the fruit. Growth in our Christian life is natural and certain as we abide. And we abide. I want this to be, if nothing else goes deep into your heart, I want you to have this in your heart. Abiding is repenting. Abiding is honoring the Holy Spirit in your life. That's how we abide in the vine. Verse 6, if any man ab abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. There you have it. It's... It's not just a suggestion. It's not just, well, either or. This is life and death. Abide or be cast into the fire. No repentance. No fruit of repentance. No forgiveness. Without repentance, there's no blood applied to your life. Without the blood applied to our lives, we're vulnerable to everything. Just like on the Passover when... When the death angel or the destroyer was sent to, to kill all the firstborn in all the land, it was only those that had the blood applied to their houses that were spared. 
Verse 7. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. We'll just tackle this for a minute. This must be, and I, I don't research the, the hmm, hyper-faith movement. I try to avoid everything I can from them. But um, one of the terms, and it's, it's, it's rather sarcastic term, they call it the name it and claim it, right? It is a little bit sarcastic, but it is basically true. It's just not a nice way of saying it. I remember one church that was struggling in the Philippines that um, when I went to talk with the leaders to, to uh, make a, an appeal for their, their souls, really, as they were turning to rock music and prosperity doctrine and so on, and one of the, one of the elders said to me, our pastor taught us a song, and I really don't like it. They said, and, and they said it has motions, and it says like this, Make me rich, give me more. Make me rich, give... Oh my goodness. That must really be impactful in the courts of heaven as worship, huh? My goodness, but... <clears throat> the name and claim it probably really like this verse we just read. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Just ask for that Rolls Royce. Just ask for that five bedroom, 16 bathroom house. <laughs> I've, I've, I've honestly considered that rich people must, must be very miserable. You know, a, a rich person that gets all his wealth and all his children are grown and out of the house and He's got all this wealth now, so he buys this monstrous house so everyone can see how rich he is. And then these two aging people getting all kinds of age-onset diseases are in this house, just two of them, and the, the wife can't even remember which bedroom is hers. <laughs> ah, how miserable. To me, I kind of feel like the older I get, the smaller my house should be. <laughs> but a man's life consists not in the, the abundance of the things that he possesses. That's from the lips of Jesus. Jesus was infinitely rich, but no one could see it because he was enlisted in the army of heaven and living as a soldier. You don't get much when you're a soldier. You get your rations and your gun and your outfits, one or two. What? You don't get to show off who your dad is. But after the war is over, you return home. And, of course, that's what happened to Jesus. He was rich, but you couldn't tell because he was living for eternity. Let's look at this verse real quickly. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. I'll share a few thoughts with you. Abiding in the vine, that life of repentance, that life that enables us to have a relationship with God, that makes us welcome in his presence, that's what repentance does for each of us. As we abide in the vine... It causes our ears to be opened, little by little, to hear from the Lord, and to, His Word comes alive to us, His Scripture. Little by little, more and more, our ears are open, and that causes our faith to grow, little by little. You know, uh, faith, Jesus said, is like a little mustard seed, the littlest seed. The littlest seed, that's what Jesus said. And yet it grows into the largest of herbs with branches that trees can shelter under. Our faith grows as we walk with the Lord. So that we know and desire His will. That's what happens as you walk with the, God, the Lord. I believe that Psalm 37, where it says, um, 
Or it says he'll give you the desires of your heart. A lot of people say, see, there it is. There's my Cadillac or my Rolls Royce. But really, I believe with all my heart. The first God gives us the desires. Then he gives us the desires. <laughs> he, he changes our desires, then he fulfills them. He doesn't take from us. He changes what we want. You know, some people say, I'm not sure I want to surrender to the Lord. I'm, I don't know what he's going to take, like the rich young ruler. You know, he didn't really know the full story. And so he, he was rich and sad because he couldn't accept the offer to be a disciple, to follow Jesus. Uh, actually, when we ask according to God's will, we get what we're desiring. Isn't that true? When we ask according to God's will, he's delighted to respond positively to that request. Uh, the Gospel of John that we're looking at tells us this little one sentence, one verse summary. But in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, John explains the principle that I'm sharing with you. 1 John 5, 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Isn't that? That's very simple. That's it. Don't just ask. First of all, let God show you what he wants. Let God put, you know, we have a lady's prayer. I don't know, I don't know what it is about women, but it's partly their emotional side. They have more, many times, more uh, gushers of emotion than some of us tough guys. And somehow, <clears throat> That helps them to get into prayer. I, I had a grandmother on my mother's side. She was 100, maybe 200% Romanian. She didn't, she didn't speak very much English. She spoke broken English. But I went and lived with her at a transition in my life with my wife before we had any children. And we stayed with her for 40 days. And... Uh, one of the first things that happened when we lived in her house was she said, Johnny, let's, let's pray. And she'd have us all kneel down in her living room. I never saw anything like this. Every time my grandmother's knees touched the ground, she was in the glory. She was in the glory. And if you ever wanted to get prayed into heaven, all you had to do was be with my grandmother for prayer. But the ladies' prayer meeting in our church Quite a few years ago, the Lord showed me that these, at that time, there were maybe 10 or 20 ladies that would gather. My, my first wife would be um, maybe a, I don't know, a lieutenant or maybe a general in that meeting, because <laughs> the Lord really used her to help mentor these ladies in prayer. And uh, I would say to the whole church, you ladies need to come to the the prayer meeting and help and learn to pray. I said, the ladies' prayer meeting, the Lord showed me it's the heart of our church. It's really where the strength of our church is residing. And oh, how often they would pray under heavy agony of the Spirit to pray through for the things that were desperately needed in our church, in the mission field. They loved to come under the burden of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. There's prayer. At the beginning, I, I, actually, I have to confess something. I attend almost every one of the ladies' prayer meetings. I'm just a little fly on the wall or a mouse in the corner, but I just go there and meet with the Lord. And as they enter into heavenly prayer, I drink it in, and God often speaks to me in those, those times together with them. I'm glad they let me sneak in. But while they are praying, they're always open. They have prayer requests that have been brought to their attention, but they're always open. Lord, what is on your heart? Lord, what 
What burden do you want us to lift before heaven? What a precious, precious thing it is. Praying in the will of God brings results. You have the petitions that you ask of him if you pray according to his will, because he hears you. All right, back to John, John chapter 15, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. So this is the end product of abiding in the Lord. Every repentant Christian is going to come to the place because God wants it and God ordains it and God is the, the gardener of your heart. You're going to come to the place where you bring forth much fruit. Praise God. Verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. The fruit that he's talking about in this verse is the fruit of, of, of a mature walk with the Lord, the fruit of many souls that are affected for eternity because God has done his work in our lives. You have not chosen me, I still think the disciples needed to hear that. Here it was at the end of the three and a half years with the Lord. And I really believe that if they felt it was up to them, it was very, very doubtful and dubious what, what was going to come. Lord, thank you, Lord. Thank you for saying you chose me. You know, I, I want you all to think about, think about that just for a moment. Lord, thank you that you chose me. That you chose me. Because it is in, really, it is in spite of us that he chose us, not because of us. Those disciples had some pretty big problems. James and John. I was named after John. I like John the Beloved, but maybe I was named for John the Son of Thunder. There were times when James and John were moved by another spirit, a harsh spirit, a, an unmerciful spirit, and Jesus had to rebuke them and say, you don't know what spirit you're of. And they were ambitious. They wanted to make sure they were at the top of the ladder. Lord, when you come into your kingdom, we want to be on your right and left. The other ten or whoever, I'm sure you'll have something for them. <laughs> And when that all came down on them with a sense of sorrow and regret and remorse, that, Lord, we don't deserve to be with you, they could fall back on words of their Savior. You haven't chosen me. I've chosen you. I've chosen you. And there came a time when those, those carnal things were broken and those worldly things fell off like broken chains and they became pillars of righteousness in the revival of the New Testament church. God will do the same for each one of you. You haven't chosen him. He's chosen you. All right. Let's turn to my text. Psalm 91. Because we're talking about the safest place on earth. Psalm 91 is often looked upon as a psalm for trouble, a psalm for danger, a psalm when disaster is imminent. It is a psalm to lean upon when the enemy is at the door. But we're going to look at it in a little different view, including that. And most of all, there's, there's one overriding issue that I want to drive to your heart today. And it does have to do with repentance. It has to do with the simplicity of the gospel. God is not complicated and he's not demanding. He doesn't expect more from you or me than we're able to provide. He really knows what we are. The Bible says Jesus knew what was in man. And, and God knows that we're flesh. 
He knows that we're prone to wander. He knows that when we're doing quite well and we really are starting to feel a little bit like an overcomer and we flop terribly, he already knew it was coming. And he wasn't upset with us. He knew it was just something that still needed to be worked out by the gardener, by the King of glory, the Heavenly Father. Psalm 91, beginning in the first verse. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. This is an absolutely incredible statement. I've, I memorized this chapter when I was a teenager, but it, only in recent years is it just, uh, it's just beginning to explode upon my understanding how great this verse is. He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The Almighty means uh, the God that cannot be challenged. He's beyond, infinite, be, in an infinitely beyond any comparison or any other power. Satan, at his best, is nothing but a little flea before God. Satan doesn't like to hear that, but listen well, Satan. You're a flea before God. You're a gnat. You're just a, a little dust that he's going to flick into hell. God is infinite in his power. And he is the most high. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the most high. Far above every other power. And he has a secret place. Now that secret place is really important. Who, who can be there? What is this secret place? Who gets to, to be there? He that dwelleth, it says. It's talking about someone, isn't it? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High. I'm sure some well-meaning saints have elevated this verse to be for the one or two that might somehow make it. The Apostle Paul, maybe Moses. Or the, uh, they qualify for this secret place. But I want to share something with you that I believe will help you to dance, help you to leap for joy, for thanksgiving and glory in what God has provided for you, for me. A secret place... There are secret places, you know, on earth. Recently, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but there's been a lot of talk in some news uh, sources about, um, I think they call it, uh, hmm. they call it Area 51. <laughs> Area 51, it's a highly secretive uh, military uh, area somewhere in Nevada, and all these young millennials have decided we're going to crash the party, you know. And well, it's off limits to normal people, normal citizens like us. But the, this place we're talking about in Psalm 91, it's a secret place, but not to us. It's off limits, but not to us. It's off limits to Satan and all his hordes of demons. They can't find that place. It's, it's impossible. The hand of God stands before that place, guarding it for you and for me. And it's not secret to us. We belong there. It is God's will that we abide there. He that dwells in the secret place. It is God's provision. Now here's the important point. It is God's provision for the newest to the oldest child of God. As we look at these verses, you're going to see that the symbolism is very encompassing of all of God's children. So what qualifies us to be in this special secret place. It is a right relationship with God through faith in what Jesus has done for us. 
It requires that we repent of our sin. Religion will not get you there. You know, I was, one time I was uh, preaching crusades in village and town after town all over Palawan. I preached 55 crusades in two months. Every night, a different place. And uh, there was one place in uh, north of the main city in Palawan, a place that was called Tagumpay. Tagumpay, by the way, means victory. It was a little, a little town, and we held a crusade there. I preached my heart out that night, and I gave an altar call at the end for those that believed the gospel, the good news that I had preached. They believed that Jesus was the Son of God. They believed that he died to forgive them of their sins. They believed that he would wash them from their sins. If they just came to him, he wouldn't reject them. And quite a few people in that little town came, came forward, and, and I led them in a sinner's prayer. And I, afterward, I prayed for all the sick that needed prayer for healing. And after that, a man came up to me an older gentleman, and he said, Sir, would you let me say a few words to the people? He said, I'm the Poro president. I'm the mayor of this little town. I'd like to say a few words. And I said, sure. I, I wasn't sure what he was going to say. I was hoping it'd be reasonable. And he got up and he said these words, basically. He said, you all know me. You all know that I've been a member of Iglesia Ni Cristo for many, many years here. And he said, I want to tell all of you that tonight I became a Christian. Jesus washed me of my sin and I'm born again and I want to follow him. That's what qualifies you to be in the secret place. Not because you go to church many times, not because you take communion three or four times at the Catholic Church. None of that will save you. It might be very religious. It might comfort your soul, but it will not wash away your sin. Only repentance, only forgiveness coming from Jesus directly to you. To truly value this secret place of the Most High God, we must also recognize what the alternative is. To be away from God's secret place leaves us vulnerable to the attacks and the traps of Satan. Satan is the arch deceiver. He is the father of lies. When we walk out of God's will, we become an easy prey for the vile enemy of our soul. Okay, the secret place. The second verse carries on with this thought. Psalm 91, verse 2, I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my, my fortress. He's my shelter. He's my defense. My place of protection, these words mean. My God, in Him will I trust. Verse 3, Surely He shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler, the snare or the, the net of the, the bird trapper, the bird hunter. Satan, surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. As we walk along in life, we don't always see the net that Satan has hidden to ensnare us. But praise God, the Lord, he sees and he delivers, this verse says. He shall deliver thee. It goes on to say, he shall deliver thee from the noisome pestilence. That's an old English term, of course. And the better translation for us is, He shall deliver thee from the destroying plague. Or another way of saying it would be, He shall deliver thee from the wasting disease. Leprosy comes to my mind. And of course, cancer. He shall deliver thee from the wasting disease. Verse 4 goes directly with verse 1. If you read it through straight without my interjecting thoughts, let me do it. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He shall cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings 
shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. His truth. Shield we know. Buckler is a little different word. But uh, it, in the Hebrew it has the idea of a surrounding defense. Something that protects you from all sides. Oh my, his truth is that to our lives. Praise God. Let me read a couple verses on truth, then we'll go on. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 25, relates truth and repentance. 2 Timothy 2, 25, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. One of the foundations of repentance is honestly facing the truth and recognizing that we must change from our attitude, our view, our uh, uh, opinion to God's truth. We must turn. We must forsake what we were thinking, what we were doing, what we were involved in. We must turn to God and say, Lord, I want to go your way. Psalm 25, verse 5. Lead me in thy truth and teach me. Goes on to, with other thoughts. John chapter 8, verse 32. John 8, 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. This is the secret place of the Most High. The secret place, the safest place on earth is to be covered with his feathers and to be under his wings, trusting under his wings. And we're going to follow this through because this is the theme. This is the message. This is the nail I want to drive through till it's hitting the wood. Until the head of the wood is flat with the, the beam, I want to drive it into your heart. But the secret place is God covering you with his feathers, putting his wings over your life. It brings to mind the familiar sight that I've seen probably thousands of times in Palawan in the Philippines. A mother hen gathering her chicks under her wings to rest in the heat of the day after scratching for food all morning. In the hot sun, she finds a shady spot. And all, no matter 10, 12, however many little chicks, they all find a spot tucked, tucked into her, her um, what are we, those little soft feathers underneath, the down, and, and, and then her wings just fluff up and, and she has them. All you can see is just a leg once in a while sticking out. But those little chicks are safe under the wings of the mother. At night, the same thing happens. The little chicks, they can't fly yet, so they can't get to a, to a roosting place. But the mother says, I'm not leaving you. I'm not going to let the snakes or the, the varmints have easy access to you. I'm going to stay right with you, and I'm going to cover you through the cold night. In Matthew, Jesus mourned over Jerusalem with these words, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them that are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. In preparation for the Passover, the first Passover in Egypt, I made reference just earlier, but I want to mention it again. God made this promise to every household that would put the blood of the lamb on their door frame. God said this, when I see the blood, I will pass over the house and will not allow the destroyer to enter. The imagery here is like that of a mother hen protecting her young by covering them with her feathers. David said this in Psalm 57, verse 1, Be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusts in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings will I make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Then in the book of Ruth, 
After Ruth had left Moab to to follow Naomi, her godly mother-in-law, back to Israel to take care of her, to serve her, to be her servant for the rest of her life. She was gathering uh, the the gleanings of a of a harvest at at the farm of of a wealthy and honorable man by the name of Boaz, and he spoke to her as he as he saw her there and found out who she was because he had heard her reputation. He had heard a glorious report about her purity and her honorable living and her love for her mother-in-law. And he said this to Ruth, The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord, the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Here is the image that I want to leave with you today. God is like a great majestic eagle. He mentions that in other parts of the Bible. And he mentions our relationship to him in that respect. God's like a great eagle. And when we are born again, we are like tiny newborn eaglets. No feathers to fly with. Totally vulnerable, unable to get food, unable to defend ourselves. But the mighty eagle, our father, takes care of everything. He covers us with his feathers. He gently speaks to us and says, just rest in the nest. Can you hear that today? God's saying it to all of you. Maybe there's just one person here that especially needs to know that they have a place under the wings of the Almighty God, that there is a place of rest, that there is a place where He takes responsibility for your life and your future, where He's going to ward off every demon, every enemy, every every foul thing that would take away your inheritance from God. There's a great majestic eagle, the Almighty God, the Most High God is covering you if you will love repentance. Verse 5 says this, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. That sounds pretty horrifying. I'm going to tell on myself, uh, in 1967, <clears throat> my first wife, Joy, whom many of you, most of you know, knew, no, she's still alive in heaven. Uh, we were pastoring in a, a, a little mountain village in the Adirondacks called Inlet. <clears throat> and uh, we were on our way there on a Saturday. Uh, we had been visiting somewhere, and a, a friend and his wife, a couple that we knew well were, were, were driving their car and <clears throat> we were in the back seat and we stopped not too far, I think less than an hour from Inlet uh, to, to fill up with gas. And <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the man that came out to, to fill up the tank was a huge burly guy. I, I would just guess he was six foot four, six foot five, well over 300 pounds. And, and he came up and he filled up the tank and he said, that'll be so and so much money. And my friend got, gave him a, a, a quite a bit more because he didn't have small change. He handed it to the man. And the man began to, do, ply, to ply his trade. He was a short change artist. You know what, anyone know what that is? It's someone who is an expert at manipulating the money. And so when you're done, you don't even know it, but he... He didn't give you the right change. So he, he says, oh, wait, give me that. You know, and, some, oh, I, and so when, when it was all said and done, the guy driving was a little frustrated and, and uh, took the money and we started to leave. But he, he, he couldn't get past it. He thought something's not right and counted his money. Remember the total? And he said, that guy shortchanged me $15. He turned around, went back. The guy came and said, what's up? My friend says, I'm sorry, sir, you didn't give me the right change. What do you mean I didn't give you the right change? It's really rough and real strong-willed. And I gave you the right change. What are you talking about? He said, 
sir, I gave you this. The bill was this. You didn't give me the right change. And he was very, my, my friend was very persistent and I did something incredibly foolish. <laughs> I was in the back seat and I said, sir, we're pastors. And I'm actually pastor of Inlet Community Church, not far from here. I said, we wouldn't try to cheat you or lie to you. After a minute or so, he said, all right. Gave him the money. He says, I, I, I'll give it to you. Just get out of here. I, I gave you the right change. But here, he gave him the money. Well, that was Saturday. My, my friend and his, they left later that day. And so next day was Sunday and I was preaching. And boy, did I have a, a sermon. I was all ready. I waxed eloquent that next day on Psalm 91. I preached. I especially said, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor for the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasted that noonday. I don't, you know, I can't remember everything I preached, but I know I was way, way over my head. I was about 22 years old and had, what, knowledge puffeth up, but love buildeth up. And I had plenty of the puffeth up, I think. And uh, I thought I was exegeting that passage wonderfully. So that was all done and evening came, we finally went to bed. And um, <clears throat> a very unusual thing happened as we went to bed that night. Uh, we turned off all the lights. We were, the bedrooms were upstairs in the, in the house that had been turned into a church. The chapel was downstairs, and there was a kitchen uh, <clears throat> downstairs, and there was a living room and, and, and a couple of bedrooms upstairs in a bathroom. So it's pitch black, and we're in bed, and we started talking about death. We started talking about if either one of us should die. We began to encourage each other to go on with all your heart, to fulfill the promises that God is giving to us, the, the vision that he's writing in our heart, on our hearts, and that we would not let anything keep us from following the Lord, even death. And we cried. The presence of the Lord was very precious. And we, we, tears were running down our face. And maybe an hour, hour and a half went by, and we still were awake. And all of a sudden, it's the middle of winter, all of a sudden, we hear something. Man, all my hair stood up and uh, all my adrenaline started rushing through my body. I said, Joy, someone just broke into the house. So we're, we're dead silent. And all of a sudden we hear footsteps quiet, but we could hear because we were wide awake and listening. And then we heard drawers opening and closing down below. And, and uh, instantly I got out of bed, but I didn't stand up. I'm sitting on the edge of the bed and adrenaline just pumping. And, in, and through my mind, things are going, I go, oh no, it's that monster from the, from the gas station. <laughs> I told him where we live, and he was upset that we caught him shortchanging us. And so I'm thinking, and I said, dear Lord, help me. And the Lord said, well, you just preached about it. <laughs> That was not a comfortable, comforting thought. <laughs> and I, I'm, things are rushing through my mind, and I remembered that before bed, Joy had been ironing some clothes just around the corner in the, in the living room, right, right near, near where we are, not more than 10 feet away from me. And I, re, I remembered she, she left the iron to cool on, on the ironing board. She didn't put it away. And I said, I've got to get that iron. I've got to get that iron. And then the Lord said, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror of thy Boom, 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 boom. boom. <laughs> I said, Yes, Lord. I know it's true, Lord. But you've got to help me. Lord, you've got to help me. Lord, I want to trust you. I, I wish I had that iron, but... <laughs> But I know that you're much greater than an iron. I know. Lord, help me. 
And you know what? I spent the whole night on the edge of the bed. I didn't have enough faith to get back in bed and cover up and go to sleep. But I had enough faith not to get the iron. <laughs> I was in the middle. I was, uh, I was in a, a straight. And uh, so I sat there all night long. Finally in the morning, we didn't hear any more noise for a long time, but I wasn't about to go down and check in the middle of the night. In the morning, I crept down quietly and carefully, and no one was there. The kitchen door was wide open. It was freezing in the house. And I learned a very, very important lesson that we, we have to grow in our faith and in grace. And uh, I thank the Lord for giving me that lesson. It was so vivid because, ha, God inspired me to preach on that passage and then he sent a burglar <laughs> to see if I was ready for that passage yet. Praise the Lord. Okay, the most important thing is that it is true. We are under the shadow of the Almighty if we're his eaglet, his little bird. Maybe we have shortcomings. Maybe our faith is incomplete. Maybe we're not the giant of faith that we will be someday, but we're under his wings. If we're his little eaglet, we're covered with his feathers. All right, there's one last uh, couple verses and then we'll close. Exodus 19 and verse four says this, Exodus 19, four. You have seen, God is saying this, you have seen, this is at the foot of Mount Sinai, God speaking to Israel just before he visited them with his glory upon Mount Sinai. You have seen what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you on eagles' wings and brought you unto myself. Isaiah 40, 31, very familiar passage. Isaiah 40, verse 31. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength, exchange their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. God's will for you, God's will for me. Stay in the nest. Eagles grow up. Little eaglets that have no feathers, ugly as can be, grow up to be majestic eagles that can soar high above the clouds. One last verse. Psalm 103, verse 2 and 3. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Verse 5. We'll skip to verse 5. One of the benefits that the Lord has for you and for me who satisfies thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. This could be of the whole sermon, and it's not going to be. But there is something very special in this verse. God satisfies your mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed. Is that what it says? So that thy youth is renewed like the eagles. One of the early uh, fathers of medicine said this, and I hope you'll take it home with you. Let thy food be thy medicine. Hmm. I wonder how big a pile we'd have if everyone here brought to the front and piled it on the ground all the pills they take. I wonder how big of a pile we'd have. But wouldn't it be wonderful? I mean, really, wouldn't it be wonderful if your food was your medicine and you didn't need to take any, any drugs? I'm not, I'm not condemning anyone at all. And uh, some, sometimes a, uh, a medicine is life-saving and necessary. But what I am saying is that God has put in his creation everything that we need. And science is catching up to God a little bit, discovering more and more natural things that have incredible power. And um, <clears throat> I would just suggest to all of you to make it personal, your own personal journey, 
to see this verse fulfilled in your life. Uh, the young people here think they're invulnerable. The older people know they're not. And um, it's never too late. I want to promise you this. It's never too late to start letting God teach you the food that will satisfy your mouth with good things. Uh, good food does not have to taste lousy. Good food can be as delicious or more delicious than food that's half poison. Uh, God wants to help us to make a choice. God wants to teach us the wisdom. If you want to live long and healthy, we need wisdom. And we need the wisdom to take away the bad and add the good. And uh, um, <clears throat> many, of what, many of the diseases that the medical world says are age onset diseases, they're, when, when you say to the doctor, how come, how come this is coming on? How come I'm experiencing this? And, and the doctor will often say, well, you're just getting older. But that's not really true. I want to tell you, that's not really true. God didn't create us to get sick and sick and sicker and sicker the older we get. He didn't create us that way. And, and think of Israel. They, they came out of Egypt and it says there was not one feeble one, one among them. They, they, went, they went for 40 years and God said, I'm not going to put any of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians because I'm the Lord that heals you. Are you willing to take that journey with God? Not with me, with God. Lord, I'd rather have a healthy life. I'd rather, I'd rather uh, have my health increase as I get older rather than decrease. I believe with all my heart that's what this verse is saying. And it's one of the things that we will learn in God's nest, the nest for his eaglets, for his children. Never too late to let God start to satisfy our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed as the eagle. Let's all stand together. There's a song, a chorus, you, you might know it. I don't really know. It's a very old chorus, but I just want to read it. It says, keep me, Jesus, as the apple of thine eye, the, the pupil of thine eye, the... <clears throat> or the center of our eye, the, the protected part of our eye. Keep me, Jesus, as the apple of thine eye. Hide me under the shadow of thy wings. Keep thy hand upon me, lest I die. Keep me, Jesus, as the apple of thine eye. Yes, as we close, let's ask God to to let us abide through repentance, under the shadow of the Almighty. The secret place is secret from our enemies, but not secret to us. Oh, to be covered with his feathers. The great and mighty eagle of heaven wants you to be safe. Love repentance. Honor the Holy Spirit in your daily life. Seek Ask the Lord to help you make your home part of that nest, a, a place where you dwell in the secret place, a place where God's presence is honored in your home and where things that dishonor him are forbidden in your home. Amen. It's part of what it means to put Jesus first in our lives. Heavenly Father, I thank you for each person that is here today. And I pray that you will, that you will cause the Holy Spirit to take the word and plant it in our hearts. Lord, I pray that the simplicity of the gospel will encourage each one that is here to know that they are safe, that they are not going to be picked off, that they're not going to fail, they're not going to uh, end their life a, a tragedy if they will just love repentance. And I pray that you'll do that for all of us. Cause us to love what you love and hate what you hate. Cause us, dear Lord, to be quick to repent. Don't let any of us in this building harden our hearts and stubbornly go our own way. 
Don't let us justify our own ideas, but, O oh Lord, let us all open our hearts to the precious work of the Holy Spirit, sent to guide us, sent to lead us in the truth. Thank you for it, dear Lord, in your precious, holy, wonderful, mighty name we pray. Amen.